So I think a lot of people might agree that the Mediterranean diet has been studied, spoken about a lot in terms of how we should be looking at our food plate and how we should be looking at the landscape of certain foods to include in our diet. And then if you think about Felice Jacker, um, who did the SMILES trial, and, and she's done a lot of kind of research around modifying the Mediterranean diet, which is having it at a, a much higher level. Um, so eight whole grains a day um, is included in your diet, all the fatty fish, it's the Mediterranean diet, but increased a lot. Incredible outcomes that we see when we're looking kind of depression um, and mental health. But something I found really interesting when I was kind of looking a lot in your work and what you talk about a lot is the Danish um, mm -hmm. the Danish guidelines. And I remember looking at these a while ago, but you, again, you pinned it very high up on your, on your Instagram mm -hmm. social media. And I was like, I'm really interested to see what Simon's got to say about this. And many of my listeners, I don't know if we've spoken about the Danish um, guidelines on here before. So I thought actually, rather than saying to you, what's the optimal diet, which is so hard because there isn't an optimal diet in my opinion. I think it's very much on that individual and having a diet that supports their lifestyle um, through certain themes that we can kind of, we know that are good for our health, which is just trying to stay away from ultra processed foods. When we're looking at the Danish diet guidelines, what is different from then to the Mediterranean style diet that many viewers and listeners will will be very familiar with, but less familiar so with the Danish. Mm. I don't know that there's actually a huge difference. You know, I think mm. the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean diet, perhaps how people kind of see it and, and how the Mediterranean diet is defined in literature are two different things. Mm -hmm. People might see it as lots of pizza and pasta and olive oil, and certainly olive oil is, is featured in it. But mm. it is a diet that that is really characterized by compared to a standard Western diet, a diet that has less emphasis on red meat, particularly fatty cuts of red meat, processed red meats, has less emphasis on ultra processed foods. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, built, it's built upon the foundations of whole grains and legumes and fruits, and vegetables and nuts and seeds. There's fatty fish in there and olive oil. Like that, to me, that's a Mediterranean diet as defined in the literature. And mm -hmm. so when you hear like the Mediterranean diet is associated with great health outcomes, just remember like that's, that's how they're scoring the diet. You know, mm. those foods that I just mentioned, you get a higher score for and foods like, you know, red meat and alcohol and processed foods, you get less score. And so when people score higher on a Mediterranean kind of diet index, according to that, they have better health outcomes. The Danish dietary guidelines to, for me, is you know it's built it's, it is built upon a lot of the research on the mediterranean diet and other kind of plant heavy dietary patterns what i like about it is just the simplicity of how they put mm -hmm. it together and there's mm -hmm. a, a pdf i'll give you the link to the pdf you know i i just think people most people need to stress less about their nutrition Mm. We're making it way more complicated than, than it mm -hmm. needs to be. There's fighting about low carb, high carb, you know, all of these things. And so I would say to people, just look at the, di the Danish dietary guidelines. You can do it low carb. You can do it moderate. You can do it high carb. Get enough protein. We spoke about doing that. Minimize your consumption of ultra processed, hyper palatable foods. They make it hard yeah. to, to kind of get on top of our satiety and lead to um, weight gain which is a very big risk factor for many of these conditions. Um, and then we can stop stressing and then use that extra bandwidth that you have because there's less anxiety about food. Am I doing this right? Am I doing that one. right? Yeah. Use that, that bandwidth to focus on exercise and exercising more consistently and with greater intensity. Use that bandwidth to uh, connect better with friends, to journal, to do breath work, like all these things that regulate the nervous system to you know get in touch with how you're feeling and then think about yeah. the things that you want to take action on in your life that you're not like that's that's kind of like if i was coaching someone that's how i would set them up and say hey mm. you know these guidelines make it very simple we they're, they're built on the best evidence that we have they're mm -hmm. really sensible get these mm -hmm. in play and then in doing that you can kind of reduce your stress about food focus on all these other parts of our life that are really important I completely agree. I think every time I open social media as a nutritionist, I'm just like, what? 
is happening on social media. There is so much fear mongering. And the, bi- the one big one that I see, and I really just want to put it to rest a little bit, is on seed oils. Um, mm-hmm. We haven't covered it much on the show yet, but <laughs> it's, I think it's really important. And that's why I really want to make sure we do it today, is seed oils. Now, a lot of people are saying we shouldn't be having seed oils. They're going to cause chronic inflammation and, and all of that type of conversation. Um, my view is that it's just in a lot of ultra processed foods. And that's why we're having such a high consumption of these seed oils. Mm. Um, and actually that's where the fear should lie more if we're worried about what we should be taking out of our diet is removing those ultra processed foods because mm. majority of them are full of seed oils. What's your view on seed oils and you know, should we be scared mm-hmm. about them? Yeah, I think people are conflating seed oils with the consumption of ultra processed hyperpalatable foods. Mm-hmm. So what's happening is, you know, People are consuming a lot of ultra processed, hyper palatable foods. And as a result, we see these negative health outcomes, increased risk mm-hmm. of cancer, obesity, et cetera. And where I think people are going wrong is that they're attributing that to the seed oils that are in those foods. And those foods have many characteristics which lend themselves to poor health outcomes. Mm. Um, they are energy dense. They're hyper palatable, they're low protein, they're low fiber, <laughs> um, they're low in water and antioxidants, polyphenols, all of these things. And sure, they contain seed oils in there that's part of the energy density. Um, but we have a ton of data looking at you know, actually feeding people linoleic acid. So linoleic acid is the primary omega-6 fat that's found in seed oils. So when people are demonizing seed oils, usually it goes hand in hand with saying that this omega-6 is inflammatory, like you said, um, it's obesogenic, and it's gonna increase risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, and where that stems from, my understanding of digging deep into this is that there is a pathway I mentioned before, the omega-6 pathway, where linoleic acid gets converted into uh, arachidonic acid, um, and ar- arachidonic acid acts as a kind of precursor to some inflammatory compounds. Um, so when you just look at that pathway on paper, you, you, could, you could kind of form this hypothesis that, okay, well, if you increase linoleic acid consumption, you're gonna raise arachidonic acid in the body and then mm-hmm. you're gonna have more of these pro-inflammatory um, kind of proteins produced. The problem with that is we have clinical data where you feed people linoleic acid and measure arachidonic acid. And guess what? The body holds ar- arachidonic acid in a very, very tight range. It doesn't matter how much linoleic acid you consume, it doesn't go up. <laughs> so that's, that, that's the first thing to to kind of understand there's clinical studies showing that so if you want to say that linoleic acid is inflammatory it's inherently inflammatory then show some clinical data that supports that Mm. Um, and then we have and again i think this is even more important is let's go to health outcomes one of the neat things about linoleic acid is that our body doesn't produce it so Mm. if we can measure it in the body in certain compartments so in adipose tissue or in the blood, Mm. we know that that has to have come in through diet, Mm. right? It must come in Mm -hmm. through the, through diet because we can't, we can't actually synthesize uh, linoleic acid ourselves. And so that's, that's like a more reliable way uh, of determining someone's linoleic acid exposure than asking them what they eat. Food frequency Mm -hmm. questionnaires are good and there's some that are better than others. But what this allows you to do is to actually have a a biomarker that gives you insight into how much linoleic acid someone has been consuming. Mm -hmm. And there's huge studies done. uh, Again, I'll share the links to these that have looked at linoleic acid content in phospholipids, in circulation, in adipose tissue, and then in these populations, depending on like the amount of linoleic acid in those compartments, what was their risk of cardiac cancer, cardiovascular disease, total mortality. And if anything, what you see is that the higher the content of linoleic acid in these compartments, the lower the risk of these outcomes. Um, So again, if you're gonna take the position that linoleic acid is inflammatory, 
and leads to poor health. How do you explain that away? How do you explain the fact that people who actually have more of this in their body have lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of total mortality, essentially lower risk of dying during that study duration? Um, so, you know, you ma you made the most important point at the beginning, which was mm. people are conflating seed oils with ultra processed foods. You know, certainly I'm not encouraging people to eat hyper palatable ultra processed foods. I just think that this kind of idea that seed oils are to blame for the the problems that those foods pose is is myopic. It's reductionist and it's not really supported by the best data we have. Yeah.